Good morning to everybody. Uh, let us start the third session of this morning with the conference on ion pairs for, of Professor Cot Cotton from uh, Bottom, sorry, from <laughs> I'm sorry, Oxford University. Please. Okay, bon dia, everybody. Um, I begin by thanking um, the Computational and Theoretical Division of UCHEMS for their support of this meeting, um, also the Catalan Chemical Society, um, and my congratulations to uh, Carlos Gregory for organizing a very um, well-organized meeting. In fact, I don't know if you noticed, they organized the weather so that the rain only came when we were in, at dinner or sleeping. <laughs> this is impressive. <laughs> okay, so today I'll tell you about an interest in our group. My group is uh, an organic chemistry group, but, but also one that does computation. Um, about half of my students do some aspect of synthesis. And today I'll tell you about an area of, of catalysis, and that is um, around the idea of iron pairing. So to just give you some background, um, if we have an intermediate, let's say this is a, an achiral intermediate, R minus, an anion in solution, it's been shown, going back to the 1980s, uh, chemistry, which was originally developed industrially, to give you some idea that this is, this is actually used in a, in a useful setting to make pharmaceuticals, that the use of a, uh, a counter ion with the opposite charge, with chirality, induces uh, selectivity in a number of chemical transformations by the property of, of iron pairing and, and uh, if you like, um, forcing certain conformations and, and configurations to be adopted. It's interesting to note, um, curiously, that it was only actually in 2008 that the sort of complementary chemical reactivity and selectivity was introduced by Dean Toast, where just flipping the charges, so the intermediate now becomes cationic, and the catalyst is now an anion. And this chemistry has, has really sort of exploded, particularly thinking about the work of, of Ben List um, and also Magnus Ruping, both in Germany, working with the, the chiral phosphates, which have become very uh, sort of ubiquitously well-known and used by organic chemists around the world. In essence, what we can think about is that the asymmetric catalysis, that is the, the induction of selectivity, stereoselectivity, really requires that we have some form of contact between our intermediate, reagent, and catalyst. But more interestingly than that, we can think about scenarios in which we have sort of what we might call a contact or an intimate iron pair. But also there's a sort of spectrum where you can see that we can sort of uh, go from contact to a solvent shared situation where our two ions are still interacting, but by the sort of intermediary uh, solvent molecules. And then of course, as we move towards solvent separation, we would expect to see a loss of selectivity. So really, understanding these regimes are important because this is the regime that will logically give us the best chance of uh, selective catalysis. In my group, we've been interested quite a lot by sort of more conventional activation modes. In other words, Lewis acidic catalysis and hydrogen bond donation. But I just wanted to sort of emphasize that the reason that this area of chemistry is, I think, computationally challenging and why I think it's something worth bringing to you today is, is this idea that as we move away from the activation modes that you're probably aware of, so organocatalysis involving covalent bond formation, in other words, iminium activation of a carbonyl, or Lewis acid and, and Bronsted acid activation modes, as we move towards iron pairing, you can really appreciate that the in inherent directionality of our interaction between the two species is becoming uh, less directional, um, and that really gives rise to some questions that uh, computationally we'd like to think about, and those concern the number or uh, the, uh, the conformations of, bi of binding modes, um, if you like, how our two species are coming together, indeed what's going on in the condensed phase, how important is it to represent that accurately, um, and indeed this is perhaps just a more general consideration, but um, how well we actually do with the um, sort of uh, the rigid rotor harmonic oscillator approximation to describe some of the uh, thermodynamics of these situations. So I have three stories, uh, and I think that uh, these give some, some idea about uh, what we've been doing the last few years. So I just begin with, a uh, let's say, a fairly uh, 
conventional organic transformation, it's, uh, you can see that there's a CC bond forming between this carbon and this carbon. Um, you can see there's a, there's a cocktail of reagents here, but the important one I'd like to bring to your attention is, is this cation. This is actually a catalyst developed by Keiji Maruoka um, in Japan. And it's this cation which induces the stereoselectivity in this reaction. So from a sort of fundamental point of view, we essentially have something of a sort of uh, a, a protein ligand binding problem, just if you like miniaturized to the organic chemistry level. We have a transition state for an organic reaction which is going to be bound through a series of non-covalent interactions to a, if you like, a receptor molecule. Um, we realized, of course, that um, there are a number of ways that this could happen. And so when we approached this probably four or five years ago now, um, we decided to actually use semi-empirical calculations, albeit with dispersion and hydrogen bond corrections, just to allow us to really uh, sample what's going on between these two species. Uh, we, we essentially use a, a Monte Carlo algorithm which samples the intermolecular degrees of freedom. Um, I should point out that some of the molecules that we often encounter in, in catalysis and generally in organic chemistry often are very poorly parameterized by standardly available force fields. And if you actually do some benchmarking of conformational energetics, semi-empirical, particularly the dispersion and hydrogen corrected ones, often fare much better than, if you like, your standard MMFF OPLS force fields, um, uh, undoubtedly because of the, um, let's say, the uh, lack of parameterization for these specific systems. Of course, now we'd probably use D3H4 corrections, um, and we'll certainly, after Watok, look into Stefan Grimmer's new um, type binding methods, but uh, this we, we interface with MOPAC, and it's, it's very fast. The sort of energy window within 20 kilojoules per mole of all of the low energy structures are re-optimized with, uh, a, let's say, a, a slightly higher level of theory. Um, the, the logic of using B97D is, of course, even with Gaussian, our friend, we can actually use density fitting and, and get some form of speed up. We do this to generate an ensemble of, if you like, transition structures. Finally, we re-optimize, and this is the lowest energy structure. And I think that just the take-home message is that um, you can see here we have our associated anionic transition state. We have a cationic catalyst. And if you like, the medium through which they, they sort of interact with one another, you can see several what, I've, what I would call non-classical hydrogen bonds, CHO interactions, and indeed even a CH pi interaction. Does this have any sort of use for us as chemists? Well, I would argue that first of all, just, just to give you sort of some, if you like, physical sense of understanding that these... CHs are strongly polarized, so alpha to our N plus, obviously formally N plus, the charge resides predominantly on these, these hydrogens. But furthermore, we can sort of, if you like, deconvolute the, 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 the sort of 3D structures we get from calculation into, let's, let's call this a cartoon, but the use of a cartoon like this is nonetheless that we can actually derive structure selectivity relationships. So in this particular reaction, something is known about the scope. Um, and the scope of this reaction is that it will accept substitution at any one of these positions around the ring, apart from in this position here. And you can see that experimentally what happens is that as you increase the size of X, as you increase the steric bulk of X, the selectivity defined here as an anti-emeric ratio, you can see it drops from 96 to 4, um, all the way down to nearly racemic product as we increase to the uh, trifluoromethyl group. And that's due to this sort of this is our preferred binding mode, and you can see that as we disrupt this, we really lose the selectivity of this reaction. So these calculations do allow us to make some uh, quantitative, or let's say semi-quantitative statements about the types of substrates that we can use and, and the origins for um, why we observe the trends that we do. Just while we're on this topic, um, it, it's, we had an interesting result, and this was genuinely predictive. When, um, this was... Um, uh, a sort of prediction that we made and, and went back to this, um, the group of Martin Smith to test this out, we saw something quite strange, and that is that this is the substrate that I showed you already. This is the organic substrate, um, and I'm now sort of referring to MO62X results. Uh, we, we, we don't have the catalyst in this picture. I'll give you some later justification why MO62X seems to work very well for uh, these types of systems. I, I'm aware it's not everybody's favorite density functional, um, but nonetheless, we do see um, good quantitative comparisons with things like Frank Neza's uh, DLPNO CCSDT results. 
The observation is this, which this is, a, this is a, an enolate, remember, it's negatively charged. And it turns out there are two possible sort of ring closing pathways. Those of you who still remember organic chemistry from your undergraduate years may, may be familiar with, with Baldwin's rules, um, obviously a very sort of uh, empirical uh, way of, of classifying ring closing reactions. It turns out that this, the reaction that actually happens is, is formally disallowed. Let's say it's, uh, it's an unusual ring closure that you observe in organic chemistry. The difference between the two pathways, I think, is, is, is substantial enough for us to be quite confident, even you know, with the, 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 the limits in accuracy of density functional theory, that this, we can be fairly confident that this is the pathway that will be followed, uh, and obviously this is not. The interesting observation was that by just removing one of these ester groups, so the substrate is almost unchanged apart from one sort of chemical loss of, of an ester group. We've replaced it with a hydrogen atom. The two ring closure modes now, whereas before we had a nearly 10 kcal per mole preference for our formation of the endo trig product, you can see now that it's completely switched around. So now the selectivity is almost 10 kcal per mole the other way. That's a fairly substantial change from a sort of fairly minor chemical perturbation. And indeed, we managed to uh, um, show this um, in the lab with, with Martin Smith's group. It's interesting why such a change should happen. And actually, from, from sort of uh, calculations, um, we did variously looking at um, uh, lots of magnetic quantities, looking at the aromaticity of some of these reactions and the transition states. We came to the conclusion that, in fact, on the left-hand side, the ring closure that you see is a relatively polar mechanism, that is a sort of almost straightforward nucleophilic attack. And on the right-hand side, the reaction which we don't see um, is really because it embodies a, a more pericyclic transformation. The planar structure of the starting material effectively makes this more like a 6 pi electrocyclic reaction, which thermally is, has a higher activation barrier. So, all right. So, so to slightly change gear, um, I'd like to look at a, a different reaction now, but um, one again which involves the formation of a, a charged intermediate in the presence of an anion, uh, of a, of a counter ion. The chemistry is very, very old fashioned. It turns out that um, obviously um, in organic chemistry we really like our named reactions. Possibly some of you might have nightmares of having to learn tens or hundreds of named reactions. Here's one of them that's I think over 100 years old. It's called the Pictet Spengler cyclization. It's actually uh, an enzymatic transformation, but also one that's done uh, in the lab synthetically. Um, and the reaction involves the condensation of an amine with a, a, an aldehyde in this case, and then a CC bond formation. So this is our sort of, if you like, the, the condensation product. And this is the mechanism which I think most students of organic chemistry would be happy to draw, and I think one in which they would get full marks in an organic chemistry exam. You can see we have CC bond formation, and then the second step is loss of a proton. Now, the question is, how do we lose that proton? Protons don't just fall off, they must go somewhere. And it turns out that when you actually consider the, uh, the buffered con uh, conditions, we're in the presence of uh, an acetate anion. Um, not only does the acetate anion promote the initial step by NH bond activation, um, it also is obviously involved in, in this uh, deprotonation in, in step two. And the reason that that's important is that you can see from a, a free energy profile um, that going from the gas phase, the, the CC bond forming step is overall rate limiting. But as we go to conditions which more closely resemble those experimentally, you can see that the first step is preferentially stabilized and the second step only goes down uh, marginally. And we get to the, the sort of regime where under these sorts of conditions, we'd actually expect that step two becomes overall rate limiting. For us, that's interesting because I think that a lot of computational studies often focus on, if you like, the interesting sort of chemical event, which is often CC bond formation, um, at the expense of these perhaps more, let's say, um, steps that would be often neglected in a, in a typical um, sort of uh, organic mechanistic explanation. We can actually predict a kinetic isotope effect for this reaction. Um, we're about 0.5 away from an experimental measurement. Uh, we're using here uh, a Python implementation of the Bigel Ice and Meyer equation. Um, we do have a little bit of a, uh, a challenge with getting the tunneling right here. This is actually without a tunneling correction. If we do include a one dimensional parabolic correction, these values go much too high. But I think, from the purposes of, of what I'll tell you next, the key point is that this second step 
is not innocent in the mechanism, and we have to consider it uh, going forwards. And going forwards, I now introduce this reaction in the presence of a chiral anion. So it's, it's, the chemistry remains the same. We have uh, the cyclization of this iminium intermediate. Um, we're in the presence of now a chiral anion. This is one of these uh, uh, chiral phosphate anions, which I mentioned um, at the beginning. Um, this is our collaborator in Oxford, Darren Dixon's lab. And of course, this chiral anion you'd expect, right back when I told you at the beginning, what it's going to do is it's going to bind to our substrate somehow. It's going to induce uh, some selective uh, confirmation, and, and that's going to give rise to selectivity. And indeed, um, there is one previous computational study on, on this type of chemistry, and they looked at these two carbon-carbon bond-forming uh, events and showed that going on the right-hand side, which gives us one possible uh, enantiomeric product, the barrier is lower than the left-hand side, which gives us the, the other enantiomer. And you can see that qualitatively, the selectivity arises from, if you like, the having to distort the shape of our catalyst. But actually, when you go to the full picture, this is now with the CC bond forming step and the deprotonation step. You can see that actually uh, the results in, in toluene, which is the solvent used experimentally, are the red lines. You can see that actually the second step is, again, as I said already, non-innocent. And to really sort of get an understanding of an anti-selectivity in this transformation, we do need both steps. We need CC bond formation and deprotonation. You can see that the selectivity is ultimately going to be determined by the highest transition state on the right, which is TS1, and the highest on the left, which is TS2 star. It's this and this, which actually dictate the stereoselectivity of this reaction. That's obviously more complicated than, than, than previously uh, has been considered. It also makes it slightly challenging. Often, when we're looking at stereoselectivity, we like to benefit from error cancellation. If we're comparing stereoisomers, the chemistry remains the same. We often get some some nice cancellation. When we go now to a scenario where our stereoisomers are formed by different chemical steps, you could imagine quantitatively things get a little bit trickier. And I just wanted to sort of sidestep and say that, of course, there are many, many computational studies on aspects of stereoselectivity, but equally I think there are actually relatively few where there's been a really sort of, uh, let's say, um, large-scale meta-analysis of how well our DFT calculations perform against experiment. And there, I think there are two reasons for this. And the first of those is that often in the literature, we don't really have access to many of the failed reactions. In other words, unselective experiments are often left in PhD theses, and, and they're not published in Jack's tables. This is just uh, the reality of the situation. And it still remains fairly laborious to actually do a mechanistic study followed by uh, DFT calculations of selectivity, such that I think it is relatively rare to see, for example, a paper such as this from Breslow, uh, Breslow and Friesner, which show, if you like, the correlation of calculated EE against experiment. So I'm basically showing you that the green square is qualitatively correct and the solid line is quantitatively correct. The error bars are uh, plus minus uh, a k cal per mole, and the lighter gray is plus minus two uh, k cal per mole. Obviously, these look nonlinear because of the exponential relationship of EE with free energy difference. Um, so just to say that you know, I would argue that there are, we, we don't really have many studies like this. And equally, um, in fact, it's actually easier to, to, to really sort of get statistics on the performance of computation when you go to sort of more, let's say, uh, faster methods. So in other words, if you go to something like a quantum guided molecular mechanics study, it is possible to look at tens, possibly even now hundreds of, of different reactions. So, in our case, we decided to do this for 14 chemical uh, transformations of the, of the form I've shown you already. Um, luckily, by collaborating um, at source, we get access not only to the really highly selective reactions, so those that give 99% in antiomeric excess, but also those which are actually quite poorly in antiselective. And that's obviously important from a, if you like, a real world test of, of, of the computational methods because Really, you'd like to be able to discriminate between those reactions which are unselective and those which are selective. Without really going into detail about correlation coefficients, I hope that you can just see by eye that each one of these charts is experiment versus calculation. The good news is that modern dispersion-corrected density functional methods are quantitatively better at predicting, um, or at least reproducing, as shown, um, is to actually worry a little, little bit about 
uh, low energy vibrations and their effect on the uh, partition function. In particular, um, the, the harmonic or the, or the rigid rotor harmonic oscillator expression for some of these um, low wave number frequencies um, gives very, very high entropy values, uh, and often these things are, are spuriously high. And so a correction where these are replaced by a free rotor uh, description really does improve the quantitative performance of these results relative to, let's say, the, the standard uh, values that you'd get out of a, an electronic structure package. These are actually now implemented as a default in, in Orca, um, but if you use any other package, you have to sort of do this yourself, and, and we've coded this up in, in Python, or Jan Nicholas has. Okay, so um, moving on to a new reaction. Um, I can't see my time here, but I'll... Okay, thank you. So, here's a, here's a reaction where we have now a, uh, a chloride. We start with racemic um, chloride. We have a nucleophile, and we're going to use one of these um, anionic catalysts again. And, and this is actually the, as I mentioned at the start, this is the very first example of uh, anionic phase transfer catalysis developed by Dean Toast um, in 2008. The reaction itself involves the formation of a meso intermediate, um, and this meso intermediate is obviously achiral, and so whether the nucleophile attacks at this carbon or this carbon gives rise to two enantiomeric products. And the role of this coordinating anion is obviously to direct this reaction towards one of those products. Thinking about actually how this would happen, of course, there's no real obvious, let's say, canonical hydrogen bonds that can be formed between these two species. Our X plus is um, can be an ammonium or it can be an episulfonium ion. It's not the case that we have obviously um, strongly hydrogen bond donating groups of, of our intermediate here. And so we really decided to sort of go back to basics and think about how these two species would come together. And I think the logic um, that, that we, we, we really wanted to pursue was that we could try and generate starting structures in, in an unbiased way for our subsequent DFT studies. So we performed uh, molecular dynamic simulations. We generated parameters for, for each of these two species. We performed several um, uh, NPT simulations and explicitly solvated uh, boxes. And from these, we extract clusters. Um, and you can see, obviously, we see some chemical sense that the stronger the dielectric um, medium, we see, if you like, less well-organized binding. But also from these more representative simulations, we can actually pull out the clusters and use those to initiate our DFT studies and we can use the lowest energy um, DFT optimized uh, structures that, that we eventually get. So we did that. And just to sort of give you a qualitative understanding of, of what you do find in, in this scenario is that the anion coordinates to the uh, intermediate um, and it does so by, a, um, if you like, again, non-classical hydrogen bonds and you can see this is a, a non-covalent interaction isosurface we do actually see fairly well-defined in terms of electron density interactions between the oxygen atoms and our CHs. You can see this blue spot here, this blue spot there, and again, this is the episulfonium. So, so this is the main uh, or the most populated cluster we see in these MD simulations, and indeed, this is the lowest energy structure we get ultimately from our uh, implicitly solvated DFT calculations. This is the sort of anchoring mode that you see in solution. We also considered actually What's the condensed phase doing? And, and really, how well are these things held together? Remember that contact ion pairing is a prerequisite for asymmetric catalysis. And really, you can see that in a medium like acetonitrile or water, pulling experiments, uh, umbrella sampling, five nanosecond windows, we can pull these things apart with essentially no resistance. Well, obviously, we can really understand that as uh, you know, the, the electrostatic interaction is, is obviously strongly shielded or screened by, by the medium. It's interesting that in dichloromethane, we can actually get to the regime where we, once we get to point B, which is solvent sharing, there's, again, there's no restraining force. So once a solvent molecule can intercalate itself between the two, essentially the free energy uh, uh, of separation is, is marginal. But in toluene, this thing is highly resilient, and you can see that in all three regimes, contact, solvent shared, and solvent separated, A, B, and C, there's always a strong restoring force to bring these two things back together. Um, and it really is um, obviously important for this asymmetric catalysis. We use these results to actually try and um, gain some quantitative comparisons with DFT. Of course, we'd like to be able to use DFT to study the, the transition structures of this reaction. And you can actually see that the, the trend between 
our explicitly solvated MD simulations and QM is, is pretty good, particularly when we look at the binding free energy of the, the, the complex, comparing, for example, MD versus QM. You can see for a medium like toluene, MD, we're getting values in the region of sort of minus 40 to, to minus 45 kilocalories per mole. And in QM, we actually see a sort of obviously slightly diminished 33, 35, up to 39, that, that re restoring, um, if you like, force for, for these two iron pairs. But nonetheless, we're pretty confident that these two things will, will react before they have the chance to separate. And of course, that's what we need um, to, to, for asymmetric catalysis. Um, so let's look at the transition states. And, and just to say, now we can really be confident that we can apply DFT. We have some, uh, we've generated in an unbiased fashion some starting structures. We've used this to initiate transition state searches. We understand that the implicitly solvated calculations um, give us a, a fair description of what's going on in the condensed phase. And now we can try and understand the chemistry. And what's really going on is that our counter ion breaks one of its CHO interactions in order to activate the nucleophile. And in the favored pathway, the key interaction is with one of the oxygens, and it's the CH adjacent to the carbon undergoing attack. So we have this sort of electrostatic um, interaction between this oxygen and the CH. And this is what really stabilizes, if you like, formally what is an, an SN2 transition state. Um, and that really gives rise to this um, anantioselectivity. And, and, and we published this recently with, with Fernanda. Uh, and she is now, uh, just became uh, assistant professor in Edinburgh. Um, so I would, I would look out for her uh, in the future. Okay, very last reaction. Um, the final reaction is again, it's another example of iron pairing and it's another example of chirality. But this is an example where I think the chirality is a, is, is a, is a product of the iron pair and not of either of the two species. The chemistry is, again, it's, it's pretty old and, and well established. This is a reaction, it's, again, it's an industrial paper from uh, a pharmaceutical company published in JAX um, around 20 years ago. And it's a, it's a transformation which involves the stereospecific transposition of, if you like, the hydrogen at the back is moving from this position to this position. Um, and again, another synthetic paper, um, the same reaction, the same stereospecific transformation. We see that the CH, which is up, finishes up here. Again, the one that's down finishes down. Conditions involve sort of nothing too extreme. We have THF solvation, and we have a catalytic amount of a tertiary amine base. Well, this is the, this is the mechanism that's proposed in the literature. So this has more than 100 citations. Um, this is the proposed mechanism by the experimentalists. And it makes organic logic. It's a series of one five hydrogen shifts. These are Woodward Hoffman allowed, which involves the, the red hydrogen moving in an anti-clockwise fashion from here to here, from here to here, and then from here to here. So each of these are, uh, let's say, they're symmetry allowed transformations. They make, you know, decent logic. However, you can see that computation of these barriers are enormous. And even again with uh, DFT being let's say, semi-quantitatively accurate, I think we could fairly confidently rule out this pathway. An alternative pathway, which is the clockwise motion, is again a 1-5 shift to here and 1-5 shift to there. And you can see that this has lower activation energies by more than 10 kcal per mole. So we can be fairly confident that, that this would be um, preferable. But this is also problematic because this pathway gives us an achiral intermediate, and this loses the stereochemistry. So this is the proposed mechanism, and it can't really, it's not consistent with the temperature of the reaction. And this is another pathway which is not consistent with the observed stereo specificity of the reaction. So both of these uh, mechanisms have problems. And just to sort of, um, sort of go back to something we heard right back in uh, Professor Thiel's talk on, on day one of this meeting, um, we can now apply, for example, uh, uh, local couple cluster methods to, to look at the uh, energetics of these transformations. And just, this is just to substantiate a point I made earlier. The agreement between MO62X um, and a decent sized basis set and our uh, local couple cluster calculations, you can see quantitatively um, there's not really much difference between the two. 
And so I think that um, we can be fairly confident that we can let's dismiss these mechanisms out of hand. Really, anything much higher than 20 kcal per mole is, 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 is not going to happen. So what is happening? Well, it turns out that you really just have to remember something that although we're often used to seeing alcohols being deprotonated, we have to remember that that's usually because we're thinking about aqueous pKa's. When we go to an organic solvent and we compare the pKa values of an OH and this CH, it turns out that this CH is actually nine log units. This is experimentally more acidic than the alcohol. This is to do with the solvation or the, the hydrogen bonding effects which stabilize oxyanions, which don't have the same effect for CHs. So this is an experimental observation of a secondary alcohol versus indine. In fact, when we calculate this difference in pKa's, we get 9.4 log units instead of 9.2. So what could be happening instead is that our base is deprotonating the CH. It's forming this intermediate iron pair. And you can see that provided this base can just skip along one more position, it can give the hydrogen back on the same side of this molecule. And so if we can do this in a, uh, a fashion which, if you like, this species here has a long enough lifetime so that this second step can happen, this will give us a stereospecific transformation. The barrier is only 18 kcal per mole, um, and relative to the two species, this is more stable, so it should go from left to right. In fact, these kind of mechanisms have been called a proton slide by Tom Bruce, and experimentally, in fact, uh, uh, Nobel laureate Don Cram in, indeed sort of con called this a conducted tor mechanism. So we have this species here, which is an iron pair. It's chiral, but it's not chiral because it has any stereogenic centers. It's chiral because, essentially, the conjugate um, acid is bound to one side, and it's bound to the side where it took the proton off at the start. So this has the property of supramolecular chirality. Well, let's worry about whether this is maintained. Let's go to some um, explicitly solvated um, simulations. Now, of course, the dissociation of this iron pair is something of a rare event. So we could obviously go to some form of uh, enhanced sampling techniques, but we decided a far simpler alternative was to, again, look at the behavior in different media, and by doing so, we can actually qualitatively understand what's going on to this iron pair as we change the medium. And what you see is that these are sort of density plots of where the NH is located above our uh, conjugate base. You can see that in THF, it sort of remains well above our five-membered ring. As we go to a more polar solvent, it starts to move all over the place. And indeed, what we see in the course of even five nanoseconds is the conjugate uh, acid eventually figures that it can wander around this molecule and find the other side. And of course, once it does this, we've destroyed any chiral information of our iron pair. This is the event that we require to lose the stereospecificity. And so we can observe this in our uh, in, in MD simulation. And obviously, we can repeat this many, many times. And by doing so, we can actually fit the residence of this complex to first order kinetics. And we can actually extract a half life from repeated MD simulation um, of this uh, contact iron pair. And so we can really compare the, if you like, the free energy of separation. Um, in other words, this is loss of stereochemistry, and this protonation event is what we require for stereospecificity. And you can see that in chloromethane, THF, D8, DCM, that the, uh, if you like, the free energy of dissociation is always much larger than it is for protonation. In fact, protonation is really insensitive to the medium, or, or relatively insensitive, whereas our dissociation, of course, is, is strongly medium dependent. The nice prediction that we, we get is that even in a solvent like DMSO, which is obviously strongly polar, we would expect a high degree of stereoselectivity. Protonation is still easier than separation, and indeed, in DMSO, you get 98 to 2 uh, stereoselectivity. So it really is a fast reprotonation, and the, the residency of this contact iron pair, we might call this an NH pi interaction, does seem to have a a very uh, stabilizing interaction which keeps these two, two things together. All right, I think I got there. Yeah, so um, hopefully I've sort of convinced you there are some interesting aspects of iron pairing catalysis which um, require us to sort of worry about things like sampling and, uh, and confirmation and, and levels of theory. Um, as I mentioned, um, a number of the students are um, doing laboratory-based projects. 
Uh, and for that, I thank my co-supervisor, Veronique Gouverneur, in Oxford. Um, collaborations with Martin Smith and Darren Dixon, doing organic synthesis. For the work, I thank Fernanda, who I mentioned is now in, in University of Edinburgh as assistant professor, uh, Chen Peng, who has just moved to Nankai as assistant professor, uh, and David uh, for the final calculations, and Jan Niklas as well for earlier work. Thank you for your attention, um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thanks very much. Hi, uh, very nice talk. Uh, about the last part is a curiosity. So you made backward dynamics calculations, but in the end the results you get uh, are in agreement what would you get with the uh, implicit solve and DFT calculations. Mm. So do you do it for a confirmation or I don't know, so how do you uh, comment on I think that one of the challenges that with DFT, of course, even if we have a sort of limited ensemble of structures, these things are still fairly sort of, uh, uh, let's say, dynamic in the sense that the, 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 the two species still roam freely all over one another. So I think our thinking was that we would sort of capture the, if you like, the thermodynamics better from the sort of the classical simulation. It's reassuring to know that modern implicit salvation methods <laughs> do seem to be quite capably doing, doing a good job, which then gives me confidence to, if you like, go and use the standard toolbox of DFT. But um, yeah, we, we, we started with the classical simulations first, and then I guess we're pleasantly surprised when uh, you know, we sort of got some, let's say, quantum sort of confirmation of those results. Maybe it would have been more exciting if they, if they massively disagreed, but uh, <laughs> they didn't. Um, um, when you show this supramolecular intermediate, uh, which is, has no chiral centers, but it is chiral in the sense that it is mm -hmm. it's not superimposable to this mirror image in this sense, mm -hmm. this is a supramolecular chiral object. Did you think about uh, applying some idealism, maybe external chiral influence like steering the solution in the two op opposite directions, no? Maybe um. <laughs> what happens because chiral supramolecular can interact with the... Yeah, so um, obviously the, the observation that stirring solutions can lead to preferential crystallization from a racemic mixture is very sort of exciting, particularly for prebiotic chemistry. I think um, obviously in the sort of domain, uh, it's an interesting question, um, obviously in the sort of, let's say, industrial setting where we'd like to sort of apply some of this work, it, the solvent is going to be sort of cheap organic solvent. But, but equally, you could imagine a chiral bulk solvent as well, which, which would influence some of these transformations. I think from a cost point of view, ideally you'd like to have a small amount of chiral catalyst that gives you complete selectivity though. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting topic. <laughs> 